The Holy Gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Glory be to you, O Lord. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out to him and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. And of course, God's grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. So, Jesus today, we find him way outside of his normal stomping ground, all the way up, we're told, to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now we know he's been trying to get away from the crowds the last few weeks as we've read through the Gospel of Matthew, but this, well, this is way out of the way. I mean, Tyre and Sidon are about as far north and certainly as far westward as Jesus would ever go in his earthly ministry. I mean, it's almost like he's here for a particular reason. Like he's here to meet someone in particular. This woman. A woman with a demon-possessed daughter. A woman who comes to Jesus, falls down on her knees. And why? Because she is desperate. And she knows that she needs what only Jesus can give. Now, you know, it's incredible that this woman comes at all. I mean, it's incredible that news about Jesus has already spread as far as the region of the Gentiles, Tyre and Sidon. News about Jesus' strength and his power and his authority and his goodness. But you know what they say. News of help always spreads quickly among the desperate. Right? News of help always spreads quickly among those who are desperate. I notice the, the normal people, the normal Gentiles of Tyre and Sidon, they don't come to Jesus, do they? They don't seem to care that he's there. They're not paying any attention to him. They don't ask for his help. They don't seek his aid. And why? Because they weren't desperate. But news about help always spreads quickly among the desperate. I mean, that's why then, wherever Jesus goes in the Gospels, we see that the people who come out of the crowds and seek Jesus are almost always just those, those who know that they need what only he can give. The lepers know, the blind know, the sick know, the lame know. And of course, this Canaanite woman knows. You see it. You see the pattern everywhere in the Gospels. That's why Jesus is always getting in trouble for hanging out with the wrong sort of people, right? And eating with all the wrong people. He eats with sinners. He eats with the sick. He eats with the poor and the lowly. They're the ones who know that they need what only Jesus can give. Jesus even coins a proverb about it. He says that the sick are the ones who need the doctors, not the healthy. Right? The sick are the ones who seek out their doctor. They're the ones who follow his advice. The sick are the ones who take the medicine the doctor prescribes. The healthy don't go to the doctor. They don't care about the doctor. In fact, everywhere the gospel goes, you see this. Later, when Jesus ascends into heaven and sends his disciples out to go to all of those Greek and Gentile cities all throughout the Roman world, every place that the gospel is preached for the first time, who are the ones who receive it? It's seldom ever the upper class. It's usually almost always the low class, the lowly, the poor, the outcasts. I mean, we heard it in our epistle reading today. It's why I actually chose our epistle reading today for this purpose. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, this fledgling group of Christians, these new Christians they're just trying to make it in a thoroughly pagan city. And what does Paul say? In 1 Corinthians 1, he says, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise, according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. 
Not many of you were of noble birth. You weren't important in any real way. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Paul's acknowledging here that these first Christians in Corinth, like I said, weren't wealthy, weren't important, weren't self-sufficient in any way. They are, by their very essence of being needy people, they are those things that are not that Paul mentions, right? Things that are not that are to bring to nothing things that are. They are the things that are weak that shame the strong. These first Christians were the ones who received Jesus because they recognized their need for Jesus. They desperately wanted what Jesus had to offer. Like I said, news of help always travels quickly among the desperate. A pastor friend of mine once mentioned uh, this, a brilliant point it is about the Gospels. He says, you ever notice how the Holy Spirit is always giving us these stories all throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these stories of individuals just like this Canaanite woman. Individuals who come out from the crowd are distinguished from the crowd. Like the Holy Spirit wants to give us this whole new set of examples, a whole new set of heroes, people we wouldn't normally look up to. He points us to the people we'd least expect, someone like a blind man or ten lepers or remember that guy who was a quadriplegic, right? He, he had to have his friends climb him up on the roof and then tear a hole in the roof just to lower him down to Jesus prostitutes, right? A woman afflicted by seven demons, or that crazy guy who was naked, remember he ran around amongst the tombstones, afflicted by a legion of demons? People like that, the crazies, the despised, the rejected. These are the heroes that the Gospels give us to look up to. It's as if the Holy Spirit wants us to be among their company. He wants us to realize that we're like them, poor and lowly too, sinners just like them. We're the ones troubled by demons. And our sinful flesh shows us this every day as we're led astray by our sinful passions and desires. We're the despised. We're the rejected. And if you don't believe me, just read the Bible. It says it all over the place that we are by nature children of wrath, Ephesians 2 verse 3, that we are dead. I think of a tomb, right, with a dead, rotting corpse in it. We are dead in our trespasses, Ephesians 2, verse 1. We're enemies of God, Romans 5, verse 10. Poor, miserable sinners all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, verse 23. And so today, the Gospel of Matthew gives us this Canaanite woman, a desperate woman a descendant of that wretched race of people from the Old Testament who in the days of Joshua, God had commanded his people to do one of three things toward them, to either annihilate them, destroy them, or to drive them out of the land, or at the very least have nothing to do with them. She is a woman, a sinner, descended from sinners. These were people under God's judgment because they had rebelled against God's natural order of things, and yet today the Holy Spirit points us to a Canaanite woman calls us to take her example, to walk in her steps, to become her disciple, to let her teach us, teach us how to beg and how to be desperate for what only Jesus can give. And that's a hard lesson for us to learn from someone like her. Because I think we'd rather feel sorry for her, look down with, on her with pity Right? Just like the disciples do. Notice, they beg Jesus too, just in all the wrong ways. They beg Jesus to give her what she wants so she'll leave. They're tired of her pestering them. They certainly don't identify with her. They don't see themselves as like her. But it's probably Jesus that confuses us most in our text, isn't it? How out of character he is here. So uncharacteristically ignoring this woman in need. He even goes so far, right, as to compare her to a dog, which, I mean, come on, to our overly sensitive ears on this issue, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, can you imagine someone of notoriety like Jesus saying that today? Uh, you better guarantee that CNN or New York Times would plaster it all over the place, that Jesus must be a racist. But isn't Jesus just telling the truth here? I mean, in a very technical sense. 
He's treating this woman as what she really is. She is one despised and rejected. A natural born a child of wrath, an enemy of God, a sinner who has fallen short of God's glory, one dead in her trespasses. But wait a minute. That describes all of us, doesn't it? That's what the Bible says about all of us. And yet what's remarkable is that this woman persists anyway. She continues to call out to Jesus to plead with him. She begs him, right? She gives us the language of begging. Lord, have mercy. Kyrie eleison. And she doesn't let up. No matter how silent Jesus is, she keeps begging and asking and seeking help for her daughter. And then even when Jesus goes so far as to say that, that very derogatory comment, saying it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs, what does she say? She quips back with such a remarkable statement. She says, yes, Lord. But even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. <laughs> At that point, Jesus even stops in his tracks. Even Jesus, the Son of God Almighty, is astonished. Such faith, such perception, this woman understands. A Canaanite woman, she is the something weak to shame the powerful and the strong. She is the something foolish to shame the wise she is the one despised, but she is the one who understands, understands her place before God. She is a beggar, and beggars cannot be choosers. And Jesus responds graciously. He heals her daughter. You know, this reminds me of the story that surrounds the death of Martin Luther 500 years ago. He died early in the morning hours, transferred into the arms of his Savior, Jesus Christ. And he was surrounded at the time by his friends and some of his family. And after his death, they began tidying up the room, and he, they found a scrap of paper that Luther had written on. Now, the accounts differ as to where the paper was. Some accounts say it was on his writing desk where he had been writing earlier that day, and others say they found it in his pocket. But either way, this is what the, the note said. It was in Latin and in German. In the Latin portion, Luther made a little statement about, you know, how, how complicated God's word can be. Right? He said that a, a person has to be a farmer or a shepherd five years before they can understand Virgil's pastoral poems. And, and then he says a person has to be a civil servant for at least 20 years before they can ever understand Cicero's letters. But a person better be a pastor at least 100 years before they can understand Paul's letters. But then in German... This is what Luther said, two little sentences. The last things he ever wrote. He said, Wir sehen Petler hockest verum. We are all beggars. That is true. We're all beggars. Indeed, we have no rights. We have no privileges. As sinners, we have no entitlements before God. The only thing we deserve is death and hell, and none of us is any better than the other in this regard. <laughs> We're like dogs, really. And I know that sounds strange and offensive, but we must remember that it is only the dogs that are satisfied with the crumbs that fall from the master's table. If we think we're better than dogs, then we better know that we're never going to be satisfied with the crumbs that fall from our Lord's table. But a sinner... Well, he's happy to get even a crumb of what only Jesus can give. Because beggars cannot be choosers. This isn't easy for us. I mean, if you'd been in the woman's place, if I'd been in the woman's place, I'm sure we would have tried to justify ourselves, set the record straight. Lord, I'm not such a bad person. Look at all the things I do for my church or, or for God or, or for the kingdom. Our pride gets in the way. But real faith, true faith simply begins with seeing yourself for who you truly are and seeing Jesus for who he truly is. Faith is seeing ourselves as sinners and Jesus as the Savior of sinners. That is the way he is to be known and no other. And that means being painfully honest then. Honest with ourselves, honest with others, honest especially with God. And that is hard to do. 
You see, the unbelieving heart wants a savior, or everybody wants a savior, but the unbelieving heart wants a savior of great miracles, a savior of great provisions. The unbelieving heart is very impressed by the feeding of the 5,000 and the breaking of bread and, and the walking on water. But forgiveness? Eh, not so much. But such little crumbs are enough to satisfy you and me. Because in faith, we, like the Canaanite woman, know that just a crumb of his grace is more than enough. In Jesus' name, amen.